Um, so I think he uh, gave us the quick introduction and the titles we've had before and things like that. Um, but um, just to reiterate, my name is Steve Kapp and I, I'm the founder of uh, something called thebridgebk.com. It's the bridge, it covers Brooklyn business news. And um, one of the things that um, I did on my day one uh, when the website went up was had a story about this thing called Vice News Tonight, which is, was new and Josh had pioneered it. And um, we said, this is, this is gonna be big, or this could be big. Probably put a little qualifier in there, but this could be big and it's straight out of Brooklyn. And um, it was a very exciting show and part of the whole Vice video news combine up in Williams, coming out of Williamsburg. Flash forward about a year later and um, there was a, a report on Vice News Tonight um, behind the scenes with white nationalists in Charlottesburg. And um, it, it blew up, it went viral, it was so dramatic. Um, it was uh, you know a young reporter in hotel rooms and behind the scenes with all these guys with guns. It was super dramatic and that really, I think, was when tens of millions of people realized this Vice News is, is a big uh, thing that's on the scene. So, Josh, as you, as you um, I, we'll talk about more, but um, Josh, as it, I think it was mentioned, was before he was at Vice News, he was at uh, Bloomberg, Chief of Content, and the Bloomberg Business Week. Before that, at Time, uh, Deputy Editor, Head of the, of the website. And um, I happen to know, because I worked with Josh, full disclosure, back then, and he was also a writer, a prolific writer of cover stories. He was a music critic, and he wrote a prophetic cover in 2005 about a guy just coming on the scene named Kanye West, and the headline was, Why We Can't Ignore Kanye. I mean, now sometimes we occasionally feel like we wish we could, but uh, it gets to be a bit much. But, uh, but Josh wrote that he was going to be a force to be reckoned with, uh, even though he was a rapper who wore a pink shirt with the collar sticking up and Gucci loafers. So it was a, a very observant um, guy. So, so Josh, um, can you say, like, go, jumping from these different, you know, journalistic milieus, there, there's really a big culture difference. When you went from Bloomberg um, to Vice, what did you kind of expect and what were you surprised by in the audience and the staff? Yeah, I mean, look, at each one of these things, these are not small companies. Bloomberg has 16,000 people. Vice has 3,600. They're both founder-run organizations, and it's like hopping from one civilization to another. And if you look at Mike Bloomberg and you hear him talk, there's like an 80% chance you can guess the attributes of what it's like to work at Bloomberg. If you look at Shane Smith and hear him talk, just about the same ratio. And so I um, enjoy being a tourist. Um, Time Inc., by the way, Steve and I both know, was its own unique civilization. Um, I like hopping between those various things. And so I was kind of eager to make that move. I also try to figure out how to, you know, it's a challenge as it is for all of us, how to be yourself within these environments. Um, my fastest way is to dress down as quickly as possible and let everyone know, you know, how to set those expectations. Advice, it wasn't a problem. Um, so I didn't have to break them in. But, you know, the, the other obvious thing is just at Bloomberg, I was most of the time the youngest guy in the room. Um, and at Vice, I am 100% of the time the oldest guy in the room. And there is a real attitude shift to that, which I found incredibly refreshing as I was entering the middle of my career. There are a bunch of people who don't give a shit what you did before you got there. They do not care. They're not going to Wikipedia you. They're not going to Google you. They want to know what you can do for them today. Um, and that keeps you really, really fresh. Now, this is something we talked about backstage, and I wanted to follow up before I forget it, but it, um, which is you have all those people coming in who are advice, you know, average age 30 or something, and they're very well educated, very gung ho, um, and, you know, but they're going into a field that's being really disrupted, you know, and how do you pep talk them about that? They're still enthused, but they see the headlines. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of questions, you know, when I was coming up within Time Magazine, there was no, you didn't ask, what's my career? You, there was a path. And there were people who were able to afford schools and vacations and houses. And, you know, the, the work balanced out with their phase in life. And that is just very hard to find in journalism. So we're having a lot more early career guidance and conversations about like, well, what, what does a path look like? What do I have to do? Um, there are certain jobs that 
just their talent droughts that I can see. Um, you know, it is very difficult to find skilled editors of text journalism. It's, I think, after 20 years of telling people, oh, the, the business is dying, there's no future. Well, they believe us now. <laughs> They're just not coming. Yeah. Um, it's much easier on video. But even with video, the degree to which people have hybridized their skill sets in advance of, of adaptation is amazing. Not everybody is great at two things. But you know, where, where I was coming in and was just hoping to be pretty good at one, most of the people who come in through the door have a natural gift at one thing and have backed it up with knowledge about two or three other sets of craft. And so they're, they're adapting really quickly. That said, it does concern me. I mean, one of the things that when you're thrust into a, at a relatively young age, being the Potter familias of this group is like, oh my God, what am I gonna do for these kids? How are we gonna protect them? And I don't have the answer for them. I don't know what, what the journalism business is gonna look like in five years mm -hmm. if we keep going the way we're going as far as the journalism economy works, which is make stuff, share it for free on platforms that um, profit from it, but don't share the profit, and condition your user not to pay for it. That doesn't sound great. Um, you know, luckily we're in a position where that's not us right now. Um, but it, it definitely concerns me. Um, pivoting to your audience now, in terms of young people, um, I work with someone who actually who is running the the thing up here, right? um, and she was saying before this that you know a lot of my friends they really don't know what's going on out there. Yet you 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 know and there's distra all those distractions we know did you know Fortnite, PUBG, all these old all these kids games, and um, um, but you run a business though that is delivering to young people. Do you, what do you how do you find that? Is there a short attention span or is that kind of a No, I think that there's just a, a very well-earned cynicism about media, which is there's yeah. so much of it. And particularly if you were raised, if you came of age after 2007 or 2008 when social media was just a fact of life, um, you were conditioned around a media environment in which there was always a race to the bottom. It was like, how fast can I get you to just open this thing? Uh, it doesn't matter if you read it all the way, you clicked it, we're going to measure it, it's great. So I think that that cynicism is really earned. And part of Vice's strategy and part of what attracts me to the place and to the gig is that we're playing the market inefficiency, which is, okay, well, what if it's really long but it's really good? Can you attract enough of a crowd to that to serve as a sort of beacon? And then what if you repeat it and earn it again and earn it again? And so... Part of, when, you know, when I was first talking about Vice News Tonight, which just basic facts for those of you who haven't seen it, is 7.30, uh, Monday through Thursday on HBO. Um, no studio, no anchor. Um, it's an entirely field-reported nightly newscast. Part of what I liked about it is we got to play scarcity versus everybody else's abundance. CNN is on 24 hours a day. God bless them. I don't know if I could do a better job, you know? Right now... I, I, when I left to come here, I was looking in the control room. All three cable networks have a Trump tweet on the big screen and the hurricane in a little picture in picture, right? You got 24 hours to fill. I mean, 44 minute hours that you have to fill at a budget, but it's exhausting. If you're a viewer and you're exposed to that and to Facebook and to Twitter, and God knows what else you're exposed to, you're up to speed, but you're not really getting the endorphin kick of being well informed. Well, we have 22 to 29 minutes a night. We have no ad breaks. We have no s sponsors. We have no censors. Well, what would you do if you were actually given somebody's attention for 24 minutes? Like their rich, full attention. And that's plenty. I mean, I, the, I don't know about you guys. Like, do you get 24 minutes a night of your significant other's attention? <laughs> Or your kids or your family. So like, it is a super high compliment when you devote your brain to someone else's storytelling for that long. And I actually thought, well, no, you know, this might be the moment to sail into the breeze. So it's definitely worked for us. And it is really attractive to be able to do that. But the cost of doing that is you can take zero for granted. Because you're basically saying these 24 minutes are going to be better for your information than the other 12 hours you spend. And if we tell people stuff they know, I mean, we don't do tweets, honestly. They don't work for us. 
what, what the hell do you say? He tweeted this, unbelievable. <laughs> okay, well, we're done, right? Like, what, how do I, what's the next three minutes? Um, so we really made a principle of news is stuff you actually don't know. News is not repeating outrage. News is not telling you stuff you've probably already heard about. News is telling you things that you don't know exist and then taking you to them to experience them. And that is super hard. And it's hard to stay focused myself, let alone to manage a staff to it, but that's the goal. And if you can deliver on that night after night after night, you probably don't need to do 31 minutes. So that's, that's how we try and keep ourselves honest about the challenge. Uh, speaking of long form, the Charlottesville story, which I'm sure a lot of people here saw, that was like the whole show. Yeah. Um, what, what went into the planning of that? It, was, it had sort of the danger of old, you know, classic vice going in a scary place and putting a reporter in harm's way a little bit, possibly, mm -hmm. but it also had a serious social thing. So what, did you knew all along it would be big or no, I what mean, was I, the planning? And Steve knows this. I mean, I, I've always, I believe surprise is the best thing you've got if you make a piece of journalism or a magazine, whatever it is. Like, your audience is conditioned to a certain thing. If you don't shove them and wake them up every once in a while, They'll fall asleep on you. And so at Time Magazine, I was always advocating, take over the whole magazine. People are like, are you kidding? We have to have science, the science section. What about the people who read for the science section? I was like, there's going to be 51 more science sections this year. Shake them up. And so I've always liked the idea of keep people on their toes. In this instance, look, it was, it's a very, the story turned out to be a very conventionally reported story. Ellie Reeve, who's a, a, one of our reporters, a young reporter, um, really knows her stuff. And so she followed a lot of these lunatics into their rabbit holes on the web to find out what they think, how they talk, how do the various alt-right organizations communicate. She came to me on the Wednesday before and said, you know, I think these guys are going to try and jump into real life Many of them have never met each other. They're going to be in Charlottesville. I was like, great, let's go. Great, you know, we'll take two cameras. Let's get a little security. Uh, let me know how it goes. And that was as much conversation as went into it. Hmm. On, this, on the Friday night, I got a couple texts. And I was like, oh, that sounds horrifying. On the Saturday, uh, I got a phone call that someone had been killed. Um, you know, we have a full newsroom and a full news operation. and. We have amazing, you know, technology has been a huge friend to Vice, but to journalism in general. It used to be if you wanted to do what we did, you'd need a satellite truck and you'd need multiple people. Um, we have backpacks that feed back all of our footage. They fed back by Sunday night about probably about 45 minutes. Um, and I went in and worked with an editor. We chunked it down to about 30. It was very clear that we could tell the story at the exact length it needed to be. Um, and that was it. It was really pretty simple. And, and one of the things we like to exploit is that, you know, HBO, the story should be as long as it needs to be. When I do watch the network nightly news, which isn't bad, but is, a, is sort of victimized by its format, you know, their stories are never longer than seven minutes because they have affiliate breaks and ad breaks. I don't have to worry about that. So some stories are two minutes long because that's exactly how long it needs to be. And others that are longer and more immersive, we try and take advantage of it. And this one just presented itself. And we've done probably, we've done 420 shows, which is a lot. Um, I think we've probably done 25 single episodes, just to vary it. And it's got, but you have to earn it. So we did one on um, Chinese New Year, the migration, and what it's like for the largest human migration over the course of a week is 240 million people. And we just went with a family. And it was incredible and totally earned a half hour. Um, so we're always looking for those things. But that one was, it, it, it was really easy. Hmm. It was an easy call. Another big theme of the past year or so has been the, the Me Too movement. And um, Vice as a workplace was not unscathed uh, in this. Present company accepted, I have to, I should Thank note. Yes. Appreciate that. But, uh, but, the, but how did the, the spotlight that was... Uh, on your place and, and, and many others, how did that you know, change the workplace culture for, for Vice? Yeah, I mean, uh, so obviously Vice has had a pretty significant evolution from magazine distributed on the street to global media company. Um, and so when, you know, 
allegations emerged is totally earned the scorn and the stigma. Like you don't treat people that way and expect to somehow not have to face it. So um, I think the first story that came out about Vice was in the Daily Beast and you know, walking the room, again, dealing with, with people who are new to the workplace, new to being in the spotlight, it, we called everybody together that afternoon and said, in no uncertain terms, like, everything that's reported in this story is horrible. I, and I'm not here to speak to the accuracy of it. None of it's acceptable. None of it. This is a terrible way to be treated. It's a terrible way for the company to treat people. We owe you more. Um, I have a feeling this isn't the end, but as a group, we're going to have to talk about this and figure out what we as a news group need to do. Um, I think as the story went along, you know, there were probably about four or five stories, the biggest being a New York Times piece. You know, it became clear that a lot of the things that are manifested with men and media and power definitely happened at Vice. It's also clear that there was a, just bad management and that the reporting structures of those incidents were not there. Um, so I had a lot of people who were really pissed and really outraged and totally deserved to be. I was not particularly thrilled about the situation either. I have um, you know, my own integrity that I need to be able to stand behind. Um, what I will say is that ever since those stories came out, the company has been incredibly forward-leaning in both looking at what it has done to earn that scorn and beginning to fix it. Um, there's a new CEO. Uh, there's a new head of HR. I work with them every day. Um, there's a sincerity about it that, without naming other names, I will say I don't see in some other places in the media. But nine months of sincerity isn't enough. There, there's a lot of work that's still got to be done. Um, I like the fact that our own employees are very engaged in holding people accountable and have asked tons of questions. Um, but yeah, it was a, it, a hugely disruptive thing inside the company, and, and the company earned every ounce of that disruption. Speaking of like young people's values, we've talked about how um, that you know we grew up as journalists trying to be pretend at least that we were pretty objective. <laughs> but you've got a crew that maybe really feels their political values, maybe they tip a little progressive, you know, yeah. more than a little, and you're, we can talk about the audience too, but um, in that way, but how, do the, how does that, man, how do they channel that in a productive way? Yeah, I mean, harness it. look, it, it, there's, um, in talking about younger people as a former younger person, um, I want to be careful because obviously the temptation is to always go broad. Well, yeah. these people, and I want to stipulate before I go broad, obviously uh, it's more pointillism. Everybody's different. I've got great variation both in the backgrounds, the ethnicities, the races, and the outlooks of, of people working in our shop. Um, what I will say that seems to be fairly common among youth in journalism is that they seek moral clarity. Right? They are after ideas that allow them to order the universe into things that are good and things that are bad. And that's, a, that's been common to journalists for a really long time. It's like, you're either a good guy or a bad guy. I actually, my only real bias is toward complexity. I think the world is actually generally full of people who are rational actors. And so our job is to figure out why are they acting that way? What has incentivized them to be the way they are you have to understand these folks. And because we have no studio and no anchors and we don't deliver monologues, you have to show it. You can't tell it. So a lot of the work that we do is really at the what we call you know pre-production. So there's three levels of making a piece. Pre-production is when you're talking about it and making phone calls and trying to figure out who's going to be in it and where are we going to shoot it. Production, you're out in the field, you're making things. And post-production, you're editing it. In pre-production... It's the classic, you know, measure twice, cut once. Yeah. If you get the pre-pro right, and you're aware of what you're gonna go try and do, you can avoid what I would call the kind of advocacy journalism that may, be, you know, may strike a chord, but is it really impactful? Does it really help you understand the thing that you're seeing? And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I really loved about the Charlottesville piece is that 
Those Nazis hung themselves. Ellie didn't need to tell you they were bad people. But when you walk away from it, you realize how they operate, what their tactics are. Some of those tactics are pretty damn smart if, you, if that's the goal you want to achieve. And so it allowed them to really show you how they work and why this is a big fucking problem. Um, but those two things are connected. And so what, what we really try and do is tell people up front, I'm not interested in your advocacy and I'm not interested in your position. I'm interested in finding out how complicated you can make this story and then get us through it. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you know, I, I don't, I don't perform the role of Lou Grant or any newsroom, like this is not me, but um, people know when I'm annoyed or disappointed, and more often than not, I'm annoyed and disappointed when our stories are flat. When a person is good or a person is bad, and I could have predicted it when I saw the you know, first rushes. Well, and you're not, you're not playing to the crowd like MSNBC or, or Fox. You're some, somewhere, even though your audience may have a political leaning, you're not playing that game. No, we can't. Yeah. We, we, not only because my, my two bosses are, have given me strict instructions not to do it, but also I just don't think it's honest. Um, and it does get a little bit boring, and you do become background noise. And I, I think it's great that that those networks have carved out niches for themselves. And I don't have a problem, as much as some others do, that those niches are political. But I know that a lot of people keep the TV on because it's comfortable to hear someone agreeing with you. Yeah. And that's fine if that's what you want to use it for. For us, we need active engagement for 22 to 29 minutes a night. And that's dependent upon surprise, deepening understanding. And look, the HBO audience is a gift. You know, It's, it's educated, smart young, diverse, like it's a, it's a gift of an audience to be able to make stuff for. Um, cool. Hey, by the way, um, we are in, we'll talk for another minute or so. Uh, think of questions because we're going to have a question time and Juliet will bring the microphone around if you raise your hand. But I wanted to do one follow-up to the idea of like com complexity and that is that, you know, TV likes action to some degree. It also likes talking heads and people shouting at each other. But um, one thing that Vice has boldly done is gone out in the field. But now you're doing, talking about complicated things like uh, a trade war or, or a tax cut or things that are kind of hard to, you know, they're complicated. What techniques have you used to explain that to people and that, that works? I mean, design, animation, and performance are the things we use. So um, we have a killer design team, and our graphics really pop. Um, one thing that I learned to appreciate at Bloomberg is that data properly organized, makes a pretty convincing storytelling device. So those guys are terrific at it. Um, one thing that I think TV and TV news in particular has fallen out of step with is that, um, you know, if they can't show it, they don't show it. They just won't do a story. And you're busy reading your social feeds and there's something that's lighting up that you want to know everything about. Well, that's a New York Times story because we don't have any footage, sorry. Well, if you're going to be the news source in people's lives, you better find a fucking answer. It's 2018. Like, you can't just shrug. So we use a lot of animation. Um, really beautiful and sophisticated animation has gotten a lot cheaper and a lot faster. So when we want to tell people what's going on inside one of those detention centers, and we don't want to use the one still photo they distributed, but we have good reporting, we'll animate it. And we'll dramatize the visual while sticking to the facts in audio and in text. And then the other thing that's just never to be underestimated, just writing and performance. We have a couple of correspondents who are incredibly entertaining. And not in a goofy way, not in a daily show way. They just write well and they can look into a camera and tell you something and you're like, well, that was pretty funny and pretty interesting and pretty smart and pretty fair. And so... Particularly in DC, you know, at the White House right now, there's about eight people who are sourced. And you know them all because you're reading them, you're devouring them, I know you are. But the news is being made by eight people. Um, and it needs to be explained in bigger and broader ways. And so our DC team has become particularly adept at taking something that seems crazy, walking people through it, whether it's Manafort or Michael Cohn, whatever it is, and you're engaged with them because they're good and because that's the best version of a dinner table conversation directed at you. And so 
we don't have as many tools as we have and we need to do an immersive piece out in the field, but we found some things that now we can move quickly, get it, and it makes good television. Um, great, questions? Is out there, right up here? Or, or is there some, okay. we'll go ahead. That mic is gonna take a long time to get here. <laughs> go ahead. WNET, Channel 13, News, News Hour. We got to compete with anybody that could take anybody's eyeballs. I mean, it's a finite, it's a zero sum game, the attention economy, right? If you're paying attention to something else that's not us, you're a competitor. And not in a cutthroat, you know, time Newsweek kind of way, but like, yeah, we, we're trying to get everybody to watch us no matter what else they might be consuming, because I know there's just a limit on how much news people are going to take every day. Anybody else? Oh, questions? Good. Oh, there's one in the back. Hi, thanks for being with us today. I was just wondering, you your, talked about your, your unique um, platform of 24 minutes, you know, really deep story, once one time a night, but there are these other kind of similar platforms that are coming online, the um, circus on um, Showtime, even the daily of the podcast. How is this kind of unique platform that you're using now, how are, I guess, are you adapting or with all of these other ones that are coming on board that are similar? I mean, we're, yeah, we're always evolving it. It's never done. Um, well, I think part of what made nightly news vulnerable for us is that all three networks are on at the same time, with the same format, with the same ad breaks, with one person behind a desk. And it's like, well, differentiating isn't going to be too tough. Um, but yeah, now that we're out there, other people are doing similar verite storytelling, and we just have to keep evolving. Now, I mentioned doing full episodes. Variation throughout the entire show is the key. What, you know, you want to keep changing tempo. You want to change look, feel, audio. There's so many tools in which you can change it up. Um, sometimes you want a correspondent. Sometimes you want no correspondent. Sometimes you do something off the news. Just as an example, tonight, I know there's a hurricane because cable has me covered. Um, you know, one of the ways we decided to cover the midterms uh, and all of the women running was not to do a series of packages like, hey, the blue wave, the pink wave. No, we've done a four-part um, simultaneous documentary on a female candidate in California who's 31 years old and might win. And so we're airing part three of that tonight. It's a full episode. Um, so surprise, we, we just have to keep surprising the audience. I think it's great that all those other things are out there. I think many of them are really strong, um, but they scare us, I hope, in a productive way. Does, oh. Thank you very much. This has been a really informative conversation. Um, my question pertains to the reporter you had that, that approached you concerning the Charlottesville story and that, that it was something that she was really interested in. And so as a, as a new CEO of a company, I'm, I'm very fascinated in how to foster that sort of initiative in uh, employees and in team members. And I'm wondering if you guys are just really great at finding these people or if this is some part of your culture that you're really instilling into your reporters. I mean. To, to really boil it down, there's two crucial things. One is you better hire right. And so we, we have a rigorous, I had to hire 130 people in three months for a newsroom. And I don't remember those three months at all. I have no idea what happened. But I was very focused during those three months. And we gave people taste tests. We, we did collaborative hiring. We made sure that we could get the best or as best as we could do. And our attrition rate out of that 130-something is really small. So we did well. Um, and that's not on me. That's on the, the people that I work with who really nailed it. And the other thing that I did really take away from Bloomberg is like put as little distance between people with ideas and decision makers as possible. And so I sit in the middle of a shithole basement with no office, a desk about this size, 
So if Ellie has an idea, she knows exactly where I am. She knows exactly how to get it to me. And it goes from things she's thinking about to approval and out the door in an hour. And legacy media companies still struggle. I mean, when I, very briefly, I was named the editor of Business Week. And for three months, I worked at the McGraw-Hill office before B Bloomberg actually took possession of the magazine. So I walk in on my first day. I wore a suit because... First day, but I, I changed out fast. I walked into an office that is bigger than any apartment I will ever own. It was insane. It was on the 58th floor. It had a view of like, I think all of the Hudson. Like I could see up to Montreal. And, and I was like, oh yeah, no, I, I wonder why this place is having problems with communication. Like you could be in my office and not talk to me. So yeah, like get in there. You, it, you own, you are the nexus of all those conversations. You have to own it, you have to act on it. If people think there's any distance between a decision and them, they're not gonna bring it to you. Well, our stage manager is saying that we're done, but he doesn't have an orchestra to play over us, so we can sit here talking for a long time, but we'll respect that, and we'll leave it there. Uh, oh, thanks oh, apparently oh, not. Mine is more of a statement, so I'll just have oh, okay. it. Oh, so, okay. Always the mom. Um, <laughs> my daughter's majoring in journalism, so I just want five minutes of your time when this is done. So that's oh, it. oh okay. <laughs> here's the only problem. I have to go make a show. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks a million, Josh. Appreciate it, and thank you all. Thank you. Great. Thanks.